Hello, Damascus Christian School families. I'm here today to share some exciting news with you. Many of you are aware that we've been experiencing a tremendous amount of growth the last several years. In fact, we've had three record-breaking years of enrollment. With this, growth has become a pressing need for more space, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. To solve this problem, we've launched this Building on Faith campaign to build more buildings and facilities to facilitate our ministries. We are currently closing in on $3 million fundraised, and we look to be breaking ground in the near future and preparing ground for these new buildings. However, we still have some challenges that practically sit before us as we look at the 2024-2025 school year. We sought out a lot of individuals and organizations and people for some insight. We've talked to our school board who has a desire to see the school grow. We talked to our ACSI accreditation team this last fall. We've talked to numerous other Christian school administrators and sought out the counsel from our consultant. The feedback they gave us was invaluable for us to continue pursuing our desire to grow. And with that, we came down to four options to address our growing enrollment for the next school year. Three of these options we did not find suitable given what we've been called as a school ministry to grow. The first option was to look for a portable to bring on to our current campus. Unfortunately, we could not bring a portable on and have students in those until the end of the 2024-2025 school year. The second option would require us to not have kindergarten for the 2024-25 school year, which we also did not find acceptable. And the third option was to go back to only one class per grade and to have some students leave the school who are currently enrolled for us to maintain the capacity limit on enrollment. We did not find this acceptable either. Our fourth option was to search for a satellite campus. After an extensive search, we found Barton Community Church, which is less than 10 minutes away from our current campus, and they will be hosting our secondary students for the 2024-2025 school year. We're excited about what Barton Community Church has to offer our students. We'll be transitioning from seven dedicated classrooms for our students to eight, and three of those classrooms will be larger than any that we currently have on our campus at Damascus Christian School. We will also have access to a gym that we can use for sports practices after school, for PE and recreation. An added bonus is this gym has a rock climbing wall for our students that they will be able to use. We'll also have access to an industrial sized kitchen that's much larger than our current kitchen for home ec. We'll also have an outdoor amphitheater where our students can get together and worship outside around a fire pit during the course of the year. And most importantly, we're very confident this space is gonna maintain the safety standards that we have for our students. Especially the fact that this campus has a respite for Clackamas County Sheriff's Department deputies to come here to take a break during their patrols. Having a deputy here on campus is another added safety measure that we're looking forward to. Although we know some families will be disappointed about having the secondary students here on one campus and the elementary students on another campus, or the challenges with transportation, we have thought about these ahead of time and we are gonna be doing some specific things to address these concerns. We will be having the secondary students on our main campus several times during the school year for intentional assemblies, buddy class activities, and all school worship. Our desire too is this is a short term solution and that we will have all of our students back on our main campus and new facilities and look forward to our ministry continuing to grow and thrive. All right, good morning. Welcome to Damascus Community Church. Uh, my name is Jonah Carpenter, uh, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our church family um, this morning. If you are new with us, if you're here for the first time or you're newer to our uh, community, uh, thank you for joining us. We'd love the chance to get to know you better, so please fill out a communication card. You can find them on our welcome table out in the foyer. Um, and if you fill out a physical card, you can drop it in one of our four offering boxes that we have in the foyer. Um, you can also fill out an online form. If you go to our website and you click on the Contact Us button, um, you can fill out a, a digital version of our communication card, um, and we will contact you uh, later this week. So if you are new, welcome to our church community here. Um, so as you saw in the video, God continues to bless the growth of our school, and we've run out of room. It's a fantastic problem to have. Um, and as we continue to work towards the construction of phase one of our campus master plan, um, well, it won't be accomplished uh, by the start of the upcoming school year. So we've partnered with Barton Church uh, to provide us with a temporary satellite campus for our secondary students. 
Uh, for more details on this transition, visit the church or school websites or speak with our school superintendent, uh, Zach Davidson. Uh, this morning, we also want to let you know that as part of our desire to grow as a haven, which is a place to find healing in Christ, we're partnering with a ministry called Call to Peace uh, to host a special training seminar called Protect the Flock on Saturday, April 20th. This seminar will uh, discuss how to identify and care for families experiencing domestic abuse. You can register to attend online at our website. Also this month, our men's ministry is hosting the annual men's getaway for the weekend of April 26th to 28th at Camp Morrow. Uh, there are signups out in the foyer, um, or you can just write men's getaway on a communication card, and we will follow up with you. For more information, you can also contact Ben Landold. Uh, also next Sunday, uh, our children's ministry will be hosting our next family night. Uh, this event will be from 4 to 6 um, for our families with uh, children who are either newborn all the way up till 6th grade. Uh, there will be a group discussion for parents on the potential adverse effects of social media on healthy childhood development, childhood anxiety, hosted by qualified mental health professional Daniel Flowers. And the elementary children will be having some time in the gym learning, the vo uh, learning volleyball. Um, there will also be child care for children who are newborn uh, through preschool. Afterwards, everyone will gather together for a potluck dinner uh, at the gym. So for more information on this or to sign up to bring a dish, contact Angela Karch, our children's ministry director. All right, we'll also have some exciting news from our student ministries specifically. Um, over spring break, we had the chance to go on a missions trip. Several of you have heard about it and have been praying for us and have donated to our cause. And so uh, I'm excited to be here to give you an update on exactly how that trip went and, um, yeah, all, all that happened. So uh, we went up to Federal Way. If you've never heard of Federal Way, it is a town between uh, Tacoma and Seattle. Um, it, the reason that we went up to Federal Way is because years ago, during our sports camp, um, Jonathan Lee, uh, the pastor of Connections Church, brought a group down to us, uh, and they, they served in, in our community here. They helped us with our sports camp, um, and so we wanted to return the favor by, by sending a group up uh, to serve alongside them. Um, so that's what our, our students did over spring break. All right, next slide, please. We did a lot of things. Uh, we were there for five days. I could easily spend five hours talking to you about this trip. I won't, uh, but I, I could. Uh, I'm just going to give you kind of some, some highlights from things that we did while we were up there. Um, on our first full day in Federal Way, we went and served at a food bank where we were able to, to pack meals for people to give them the food they needed to, to survive. And in doing so, we were able to show them the fact that they're loved and valued by God. We also got the chance to uh, sing at a senior center that was up in Federal Way. Uh, I don't know if you can see it that well in the picture, but uh, there's our students uh, on the, the left there singing uh, Amazing Grace for our students. And then um, you can see in the lower uh, picture there, um, people got really into the worship and raising their hands and, and praising God. Um, we also helped this food bank uh, set up for a fundraiser that they had going on by, by cleaning up their facility, by sorting some things that, that they needed sorted so that they could raise money to, to continue to, to provide food and, and care for people. All right, next slide, please. Uh, over the course of the rest of the week, we did a, a lot of different things. We partnered with a Young Life facility, and we helped them uh, reorganize their space. You can see us with that, that pool table over there. We ended up moving that and, and doing some repair work for them on, on their site. Um, we also ended up uh, serving at Black Lake Bible Camp, a place our students go to over the summer. We, we helped them with their... Um, yeah, some facility needs that they had. You can see in kind of that, that bottom corner picture, us scraping tape off of uh, a floor, clearing out their facility. Um, we also went and blessed a couple of schools by going and partnering with them, by encouraging teachers there, by having conversations uh, with them uh, to show them that, again, they are loved and valued by the God that we worship. Um, and we also partnered with World Relief, an organization which seeks to preach the gospel um, to uh, families that are, that are new to our country. And so we, we cleaned out some, um, some refugee housing. Uh, and we had the chance to actually help them sort some clothes that they were going to use to, to give to people uh, who are new to our country, again, to show them that they are loved and valued by God. All right, next slide, please. So as incredible as the things we got to do during this trip were, the, the thing I'm most excited about when it comes to this trip is, is the impact that it's going to continue to have on our students um, since we've arrived back. Uh, on our last day of uh, our trip, we had a conversation saying, hey, what are you going to take away from this trip? And the answers I heard from students were overwhelmingly encouraging to me and to my team. Um, many students said that they didn't realize how capable they were of serving God's kingdom before this trip. But, but since they had got the chance to go out of their comfort zone to, to share the gospel with people who hadn't heard before, they, they felt more equipped that as teenagers, God could use them. They felt more confident in their ability to be used by God to further his plans. Um, they were encouraged by their own ability to, to really make a difference in people's lives for the sake of the gospel. 
Many of them also shared the impact that, that they saw happen just from the small things they did in their life. And they were excited to, to learn that even the, the little things that they do in every day of their life can be used to serve the king, can be used to glorify God. And they were excited to continue uh, to grow in, in using these small gifts that God has given them to serve the kingdom now that they were back at home. All right, final slide here. Uh, for all of you who donated to our trip, for all of you who prayed for us or, or supported us on our trip, we would just like to say thank you. Um, God really did incredible things in and through us in a federal way. Uh, many people got to see the love of God displayed to them, perhaps for the first time. Uh, our students walked away transformed and, and, and changed in a way that I think will, will stick with them for the rest of their life. And so for all of you who are able to make this trip possible through your donations and through your prayer, sincerely thank you so much uh, for partnering with us on this trip. Well, that being said, as we open up the service this morning, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the incredible things you're doing uh, to secure the future of this church, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this trip, for the opportunity that students had to learn more about you, for the chances that they had to, to grow. Um, and Lord, we pray that, uh, that that would really fuel the future of their lives and their ministry in you, God, and that that would be um, a foundation you can build the future of this church upon, God. Uh, Lord, we also thank you for the school for uh, just its expansion, for the different families that are being ministered to here, God. Um, we thank you for the, the growth that we've seen there, God. And, and we pray that as we uh, reach out to partner with um, Barton Church, that, that you'd give us wisdom um, to know the best step forward, God. Thank you for this relationship we're going to be able to build with them, God. Um, Lord, we thank you so much in everything for your faithfulness in this church and in our community, God. Uh, and we pray that we would be wise enough to be faithful to the call that you've given us. Um, help us, God, uh, to discern the best path forward in all things, God. We thank you for your goodness, for your love, for your mercy, and for your faithfulness. And I pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and let's all sing together this morning. All creatures of our God
we are thankful for your goodness and that we can be faithful with the gifts that you've given us. All the glory to you. Amen. Good morning. You may be seated. Well, this morning we're picking up where we left off in our series in 1 Corinthians, so please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. And this morning we'll be reading from verse 18 through chapter 7, verse 9. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to, sexually, to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, so that you may devote yourself to prayer. But then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. We just sang about the goodness of Jesus, and this morning we're going to talk about one of the good gifts that he gives to us. So I've said we are returning this, this morning to our series in 1 Corinthians, a series we've called Imperfect Church, Perfect Christ, and we've come to chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, which is about sexual intimacy in marriage. And so get ready this morning, we're going to have the proverbial sex talk. And so if you're a parent, you've got kids in here, uh, I'm going to do my best to be careful and respectful on this topic and everything, but um, you may want to have your kids here and then talk with them afterward about it, uh, or if you prefer, we do have children's ministry, but just want to give you that warning um, and that caution. It is a good topic to talk about. Um, someone may say, wait a minute, Andy, you're actually going to talk about sex in church? Like, I thought that was one of those topics that you didn't talk about in church because it made people feel uncomfortable, you know, like money, and politics, sex, right? Well, we're going to talk about it this morning because that's where the Bible has taken us in our series, and, and it's a good thing, too, because we live in a culture that is horribly confused on this topic. And much of the confusion and the miseducation has come through the incessant barrage of sexual language and sexual activity in the media, in TV and movies. In fact, that was the topic of an article in Relevant Magazine from August of 2022. And in that article, titled, Three Myths Movies and TV Have Taught Us About Sex, author Andrew Byers identified three lessons that entertainment media has taught us that are not consistent with how God views sexual intimacy. He argues that modern media essentially paints sexual intimacy as something that, number one, doesn't happen to normal people. It happens to, quote, really hot young people. So that's what the media presents. Not, it's not for normal people, it's just for them. Number two, it doesn't happen in normal contexts of the regular, mundane, married life. It only happens in unrealistic, magical settings, in spontaneous and hyper-romantic moments with near strangers. That's what the media presents. And then three, that sex is itself the ultimate goal of a romantic relationship rather than one of the many ingredients of a romantic relationship that is supposed to grow within the context of a biblical marriage. 
Byer says those are the main lessons about sexual intimacy that TV and movies are teaching this generation. And I think we would agree he's probably right. But as we're going to learn this morning, those are myths. Those are lies about sex. And they're not the lessons that God wants us to learn. And he's the one who gets to teach us because he's the one who created it as a gift for us. And so this morning, we're going to look again to God's word to see what he wants us to know about sexual intimacy within the context of a biblical marriage. And we're going to see that it really is about God's glory and our pleasure, and our pleasure in the fact that Jesus is being glorified in it. Now, married life is not all about sex, but the sexual life of any person should be all about marriage. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And I believe that there's something here, something encouraging for you, uh, whether you're married or you're single or you're widowed, I think there is something in this text that is relevant for you. And so let's pray that the Lord would teach us what those things are. Father, we come to you with gratitude for good gifts that you give to us. One of them is the ability to congregate in this place as the church and and worship together, knowing that you're with us and you have given us your word, which is your guide for us to understand the world we live in, to understand who we are individually and as a church and as people living as married people and singles in whatever circumstance or stage we're in, but your word has something to say about it and we get to, we get to read it and, and learn from it. So thank you for that good gift. Thank you for the gift of sex. Thank you for the gift of marriage. Thank you for those who have the gift of singleness. Thank you for how that makes us a better people, more faithful to walk with you. Help us, Lord, to grow, to be faithful to each one of those circumstances and roles. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, keep your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and let me remind you of the context here, because this chapter is a natural continuation of what Paul was addressing with the Corinthians since chapter 5. Uh, if you remember in chapter 5, he had called out the church for celebrating the sexually immoral man who was sleeping with his father's wife, and then in chapter 6, he called them out for engaging in sexual immorality with prostitutes. And so this is a church that had a problem with sexual immorality. And so after addressing that in chapters 5 and 6, Paul had concluded the end of chapter 6 by saying in verse 19, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And so Paul had made it crystal clear that sexual immorality should not be happening in the church because their bodies belong to Jesus because he paid for them on his cross. Now, it appears that some in the church may have actually agreed that there was a sexual immoral problem, and they had a solution to that immorality problem, and that they had written that solution to Paul in a letter. And I say that because after he closes chapter 6 with this command to glorify God in the body, he takes on that same, he stays in that same theme of sex in the body and immediately transitions in chapter 7 to take up this related matter which they wrote to him about. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, quote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now you'll notice that that second part of verse 1 is in quotation marks. So so we're dealing with a statement that isn't from Paul, it's from those who are part of the church at Corinth. And there's some different interpretation of what this statement means, but it seems to be an argument for men totally abstaining from sexual relations as the only way to keep sexual immorality from infecting the church and from taking their eyes off of Jesus. Now, they may be advocating for celibacy through singleness, which Paul is going to promote later on in this chapter, and we'll talk about it more as we come to that in this chapter. Or they may even be advocating for some sort of practical celibacy within a married relationship. And so a husband and a wife being married, but never having sex. And so this would be a drastic measure. This would be a, the nuclear option, the drastic measure. It would be like when I was in high school and I was trying to get buff and lift weights. And a friend of mine told me that um, drinking pop, drinking soda pop, and having carbonated drinks depletes your muscles of oxygen. And then you can't build muscle. 
And so I made this drastic measure, and I said, no more soda pop, no more carbonated drinks at all, ever. Drastic measures. That lasted for like two months. Well, in Corinth, it seems that these drastic measures are what people are calling for. No more sex. That's, that's their claim. That's what they're saying it will work. Well, Paul knows that for those who are married and those who don't have the gift of singleness, that's going to be a problem, right? Pretty obvious why. And so in verse 2, Paul responds to their idea with a better solution. Look at verse 2. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now, again, context is really key here. Paul has just spent a bit of time in chapters 5 and 6 addressing the wrongs of sexual immorality and people sinning by having sex outside of marriage. And so Paul here says, look, there are people who are going to have a sexual drive that if not met within their biblical marriage, they are going to be tempted to take that sexual need elsewhere. So for those people in order to help them not fall into sin and subject them to potentially avoidable temptation, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Why? So that they can participate in God's good gift of sex, but do so in a way that glorifies God, and that is within a biblical marriage. See, Paul is anchoring his entire argument in the reality That point number one this morning, God created married sex for his glory. He created it, and it was for his glory. Now just think about how God started all of this way back in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, God gave away the first bride to her groom. He brought the wife Eve to the husband Adam. He did that. Verse 23, Adam saw Eve, and what did he say? Whoa, man, right? And in verse 24, God then instituted marriage, saying that a man would leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And God said to this newly united couple, he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with what? Babies, right? Worshippers of God. And so God created marriage, and God created the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife, and within that context, it was called good. It was designed to glorify God. Well, how? Well, first, by the physical union of a husband and wife, resulting in filling the earth with more humans, more people who would worship and obey him. But in addition to producing children to populate the earth, the physical union of the husband and the wife would also be used as a picture of God's faithful love for his people. We say that in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. God is described as a husband who is faithful to his people Israel. And in Hosea 2, after Israel falls and and they begin worshiping other gods, God describes their unfaithfulness as a form of spiritual adultery. He refers to them in verse 5 as going after other lovers. But in verse 19, God still shows his faithfulness even to his adulterous people, and he reaffirms that he is committed to his people forever. God is a faithful husband. Then we get to the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul quotes Genesis 2.24, describing the union of a man and woman in marriage, which would include their sexual union. And he reveals to us a mystery about it. He says that there's a picture, there's an analogy here of Jesus' love for his church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So so the point is, God created marriage, and God created sex in marriage for his glory. 
and specifically for giving us a picture of God's faithful love for his people and for giving us a picture of Jesus' sacrificial love for his church. A love that, if you think about it, led Jesus to die, to pay for the sins of his church, even while we were unfaithful sinners, and to invite us into a union with him through faith in his sacrifice for us so that we can belong to him and we even get to take on his name. We're united with Christ. All of that is the background of why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, that each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. It is so that instead of taking that sexual relationship outside the confines of marriage and spoiling the picture of God's faithful love for his people and the gospel good news of Jesus' sacrificial love for his church, instead... Men and women could become husbands and wives and glorify God in their bodies by being faithful and sacrificially loving to one another as they experience together God's good gift of married sex. So do you see how important your sexual life is to the glory of God? You see, contrary to what the culture tries to promote, that that sex is merely this instinctual activity of evolved animals called humans that, that has no spiritual meaning, the Bible says that sex within marriage is part of our worship of God. And so if you are unmarried, think about this. When you preserve the sanctity of married sex, By not having sex or doing sexual things with your body for as long as you're not married, you are actively glorifying God with your body. It it is a part of your worship. Your abstaining from sex is worship of God. And if you're married, think about this. When you come together in sexual union with your spouse, and you do so in faithfulness to one another like God is faithful to his people, and sacrificially loving to one another like Jesus demonstrated sacrificial love for his church, you are actively glorifying God in your bodies by living out the sanctity of married sex with one another. It's worship. Which is why marital unfaithfulness And marital selfishness in this area is so damaging to the glory of Jesus. Because when one partner is sexually unfaithful to one another, or one partner is sexually selfish or unloving to one another, it taints the picture of both God's faithfulness and Jesus' sacrificial love. And God is not glorified in your body. So do you see how gracious and loving God is? See how good and he give good gifts to us? He has created for us a gift for being able to glorify him in worship by participating in something that is enjoyable to us. And it is most glorifying to him and most enjoyable to us when we follow his design for it. And part of that design is that married people enjoy it often which is point number two this morning. Married people should regularly serve one another through sex. Married people should regularly serve one another through sex. Now, I can't speak for all the women in the room, but I know that over the years, verses three and four have been a favorite of a lot of men. And the reason for that is because it truly does advocate and encourage a husband and wife to come together sexually and not limit themselves to much. But to understand why this is equally a great passage for both men and women, you have to remember the context into which Paul is writing. In the Roman world, and especially in Corinth, women were not viewed as equal partners in any sexual experience. Men used unmarried prostitutes to selfishly gratify themselves without any thought for what their wives might think. And then they would come home and they would use their wives simply to give them children. So in the pagan, non-Christian, Bible-rejecting world, 
women's bodies were generally only valued for their ability to gratify men's desires. Not much has changed. Which makes what Paul says in verses 3 and 4 absolutely revolutionary and game-changing for women. Look at verse 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So here Paul declares something that would be unheard of in that culture. A husband doesn't have sole authority over his body, but his wife actually belongs to his wife, and she has sexual rights to it. And a wife doesn't have sole authority over her body, but her husband has sexual rights to her body because they are equal. They are equal in the eyes of God. And as married equals, they belong to each other. And therefore Paul says they should choose out of service to each other to give each other what belongs to them and not deprive each other of it. Look at verse 5. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. So so here Paul encourages husbands and wives to to not deprive each other of sexual intimacy unless, and it seems that this is the concession that Paul's talking about, unless perhaps they can equally come to an agreement on that and only for a limited time and in order to schedule a prayer meeting. That's the purpose, right? If they're going to fast from that, that's what it's for. And the reason Paul states for why they shouldn't deprive each other is because a husband and a wife who do not have regular sexual relations put themselves in a vulnerable place. They may be tempted by Satan to sin by fulfilling their sexual needs outside of their marriage, which is probably one of the reasons why Paul says they should pray, right? If they're praying, if they're going to abstain. Now, it's important to note that Paul isn't excusing a spouse who goes outside of their marriage for, their marriage for sex and saying that they can blame their spouse for their sexual unfaithfulness. It is still their own choice and their own sin. If you look at verse 5, it is still caused, he says, by their lack of self-control. But this is a call for husbands and wives to choose to regularly serve one another by fulfilling each other's sexual needs within their marriage so that When they're tempted to look outside of it, they will not. They will not look for sex outside of their marriage. Now, why would Paul have to give this instruction in the first place? Why would he have to remind them of their equal rights and equal authority over each other's bodies? Well, given the Corinthian statement in verse 1 that it's better not to have sexual relations with women, Paul is probably responding to married men in the church who thought that they could gain something spiritually by abstaining from sexual intimacy altogether. So this would be like those today who take a vow of celibacy and choose not to be married so that they can concern themselves with the practicing practicing of their faith. But here the problem is, the difference is, Paul is talking about married men and women. He's talking about people who are already married. And so he's probably speaking, at least in part, in part, for wives who didn't have a voice in the matter. And he's saying to the married men, look, if you're single, if you were single, that plan would be fine. But you're not single. You're married. You have a wife. And she have right, has rights and needs. And you need to fulfill that in her life. So that seems to be contextually the most likely reason for why Paul is bringing this up here. But I think this passage also serves another purpose. And I think that purpose is this. I think it addresses our sinful inclinations as men and women. Here's what I mean by that. If we go back to Genesis and to the fall and the curse because of sin, one of the things that the curse affected was the relationship between men and women, between husbands and wives. 
Remember, part of the curse was Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, where God said to Eve in this new sin-stained world, he said, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. That desire to be contrary to your husband meant that a woman's sinful inclination would be to take over her husband's God-given headship in their relationship and try to control him in his position. And the statement, but he shall rule over you, meant that a man's inclination, sinful inclination, would be to harshly rule over and try to control his wife rather than to lovingly lead his wife by serving her. And so that was all part of the curse. That became the sinful inclinations that we would have. And so here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul's words serve as a reversal to that curse. Instead of men and women using sex to take control or rule over each other, sex was to be a way for them to serve one another as equals, as those who have equal authority over each other's bodies. It's a reversal of our sinful inclinations. Now that actually has some pretty practical applications for us today. And the first application is this. If you are unmarried... Your body belongs to Jesus. And if you are married, your body belongs to Jesus and to your spouse. Jesus first and then your spouse. Which means, if you are unmarried, your body should honor Christ by abstaining from sex unless or until you have a spouse. And if you are married, your body should honor Christ by participating in sex only with your spouse. So extramarital sex is not okay. Premarital sex is not okay. Self-gratification through masturbation and pornography are not okay. It's sin. It's sin that Jesus died for. It's sin that can be forgiven if you will confess of it. But it is sin. And you must repent of it. And you must resist it as sin. Because your body is not your own. That's the first application. Now, before I get to the second application, let me just preface it by saying this. Part of living in a broken world that is broken because of sin means that there is sexual brokenness among us. And perhaps because of dynamics of trauma and abuse or physical limitations or even medical conditions, for some of you who are married, following Paul's instructions here may be exceptionally difficult. And so if you're in one of those situations, any of those circumstances right now, I would just say to you, listen to the applications I'm about to lay out. But you may need some time and some help from a counselor or even a doctor to help you get to a place where you're even able to apply what Paul has to say here. All right, so, so there's a preface. Now having said that, I think it is safe to say that in most cases, it is most likely a husband that will desire sex more often than his wife. I'm just taking a guess here, all right? I'm thinking that's probably the case. And it is most likely a wife who will exercise her veto power over that pursuit with her husband. Now, I realize that's not always the case, but I'm thinking that's probably more often the case than not. And so here's what I would say to wives in the room, right? Wives, this is for you. One of the ways that you can love and serve your husbands and help them fight temptation is by being very discerning in how and when you exercise your veto power. Now that veto power goes both ways, and just because you veto their pursuit of sexual intimacy with you, that does not give them the permission to sin sexually within their bodies. But wives, be very careful in how and when you do that because one of the most important ways that you can love and serve your husbands and help them fight temptation and love you faithfully is through uniting with them physically in your sexual union. And so if you are able, serve them that way. Now let me speak to the husbands in the room. And if you want to know who they are, maybe they're the ones who were nudging their wives just a minute ago. Husbands, one of the ways that you can love and serve your wives 
is by not using this passage as a bully pulpit to try to force or manipulate them into doing something they don't want. Husbands, you can't be a jerk to your wife all day or routinely tear her down or criticize her, disobeying 1 Peter 3, 7, which says to live with your wife in an understanding way and honor her as a weaker vessel, and disobeying Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, which tells you to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, you can't do that and then hypocritically shame her into obeying this verse and thinking that magically she's going to be able to give herself fully and freely to you. Husbands, you can't do that. That's not godly. You want consent from her? You want her to give herself to you? Then start by loving her like Jesus loves the church. Being more interested in her needs than your needs. Start by honoring her as the weaker vessel so that God will listen to your prayers for her and about her. Because if you're not, he's not listening. That's what 1 Peter 3, 7 says. Then when you do come together sexually, your union with her will be a better picture of the unity of love and sacrificial service that Jesus has for his church, which is how you have been called to love her. Serve and love your wife before sex so that you and your wife can serve one another through sex. Because that's what it is. It's an opportunity to serve each other. As Garrett Kell has written, God created sex to be a bond between a husband and a wife that strengthens over time. Married couples make love on their honeymoon and after a miscarriage. They make love to conceive children and after they bury them. They make love when bodies are healthy and during battles against cancer. As a husband and a wife pursue each other through intimate service, sacrifice, and struggle, God blesses them in a way the world can never know. Married people should regularly serve one another through sex. Now, having addressed specifically husbands and wives up to this point, Paul turns his attention to those who are unmarried and widowed. And the message for them in verses 7 through 9 is point number 3 this morning as we close. Unmarried people should marry if they desire sex. Unmarried people should marry if they desire sex. Now Paul starts his argument in verse 7 by expressing his own personal preference uh, that people stay single if they can do it, that people be unmarried, stay, remain single as he is. And later on in this chapter, he's going to lay out why he, he believes that singleness is better than being married. But, but Paul knows that singleness is a gift from God for some people, and being married is a gift of God for other people. And so he continues in verse 7 by referring to singleness and marriage as gifts. And the word that he chooses, the word that he uses for those gifts, is the same word that he uses in chapter 12 when he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. Look at verse 7. He says, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul says some people will not need to be married or are married again in the case of those who have been widowed. Because God has given them a gift of not desiring a husband or a wife, not needing that sexual relationship that goes with it. And so it is a good thing for them if they remain single. But others will not have that gift. And, and the evidence that they don't have that gift is that they desire a husband or a wife, and eventually they're going to burn for a sexual relationship with their, their spouse. And so their gift will be marriage. So they should marry rather than trying to stay single because unnecessarily staying single, which they don't, if they don't have that as a gift, may lead them to sin sexually. As Ray Orland has written in his book, The Marriage and the Mystery of God, uh, the Gospel, he says, sex is like fire. In the fireplace, it keeps us warm. Outside the fireplace, it burns the house down. That's true. 
Now again, that doesn't mean that marriage is all about sex, and people shouldn't just marry just for the sex, but it does mean that marriage is the fireplace for sex, and so if you have a fire burning, you probably don't have the gift of being single, right? You should look to get married. Now, how do we apply that? Well, maybe you're here and you're already ready to be married. You're just like, I- I'm totally ready, God. God. And maybe God has brought to you a godly man or a godly woman into your life, and you, your family, they believe this is the right person, and you're having a hard time kind of staying sexually pure in your relationship. I think Paul would say, don't burn with passion. You should get married. Like, just do that, because you don't want to sin against God in your relationship. But if you're not ready to be married, The desire for sex alone is not a good reason to marry if you're not ready or to marry the wrong person simply because of sex. And so it may be that you need to work hard to get yourself ready for marriage or it may be that you need to break off that relationship. You need to go backwards. That relationship is leading you towards sin. Maybe you need to separate yourself from that because your relationship with Jesus is more important than your relationship with that other person. But what if God hasn't brought that person into my life? What if I feel ready to get married, but I'm still single? Well, if that's you, I'd love to pray for you. If you want to put in a communication card, come talk to me. I'd love to pray that God would give you wisdom, that God would give you strength, that God would bring the right person in your life at the right time. But I would also say to you, don't waste this time of singleness. Pray that God would bring that person into your life in his timing. Pray that God would protect you sexually as you you wait for him or her to come and use this time to prepare yourself to become a godly husband or a godly wife. How? By looking to Jesus for your identity first before you look for it in somebody else. Make sure that you and the Lord are right. Make sure that you get your identity from him and not from another person. And that way you'll be ready to give yourself to another person when the time comes. Establish good practices of serving Jesus and serving the church so you have good habits so that you can bring those into your relationship should the Lord bring one to you. And then build healthy and pure relationships and friendships with godly men and godly women and then trust the Lord that when the time is right, he will bring the right person into your life and that you will recognize it. Pray. Trust God. And if you're unmarried and you're not desiring marriage, then work to stay sexually pure in your singleness and enjoy the gift of being single and being able to focus all of your time on Jesus. Bask in that. Enjoy that. Take advantage of that. And then be an example to your single friends who may not have your gift of singleness but need your example of glorifying God in your body as they walk alongside with you as singles at least for this time. Be good examples to one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, with whatever gift God has given you, whether that's married as a married person or as an unmarried person, embrace the the gift that God has given to you now and live that out faithfully. Not only so that you can glorify God in your body, but that you can help your brothers and sisters in Christ grow to glorify God in their bodies as well. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your help as a church. We want to be a people who are faithful in whatever place or circumstance you've placed us. Lord, first of all, I want to pray for for the marriages in this body. I pray for us who are married. Pray for us as a church that includes those who are married. And I would pray, Lord, that there would be faithful marriages. I pray that there would be loving marriages. I pray that there would be those who are sexually healthy in their marriages. And Lord, where those things are not, I pray for healing. I pray for conviction. I pray for your hand to move in such a way that that is, is miraculous even. That you would protect and preserve and strengthen the marriages in this church. Lord, for those who are single, for those who are single and desire to be married, Lord, would you, would you keep them faithful to you sexually and in every other way? Would you help them to walk in purity and in truth? And Lord, at the right time and in the right place, would you bring the person to them that is to be the one there to marry? Would you unite them 
so that they could find the joy that comes from that relationship that you've given and they could glorify you through it. And then, Lord, for those who are unmarried and, and do not have that desire for marriage, maybe you've given that gift of singleness, then I would pray, Lord, that in this time, as they are single, as they are focused completely on you, Lord, would you help them to walk faithfully? Would you help them to walk uh, truthfully and sexually pure? And the Lord, help them to be an example to others as they keep their eyes focused on you, that they could help those who are walking down a path that is similar to other singles to strengthen and encourage them. Lord, we want to be a faithful church in this area, so would you help us? Would you help us individually? Would you help us together? Would you help us to be faithful as those who are your disciples, as those who are your ambassadors to the world? Pray these things in Jesus' name, knowing that all of this will only happen through Jesus' help. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing the closing song?
Jesus, that is our confession. We know that there's no way for us to be who you created us to be outside of you empowering us to do it. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are a forgiving God, that you forgive us when we've broken any one of these guidelines and, and, and truths that you've given to us. Lord, we have failed. We are thankful for forgiveness that only comes through Christ. And we are thankful for the empowering that comes through Christ to live faithfully in each one of these areas. And so, Jesus, be glorified in us and be glorified through us, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful week.